So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm, a, as I said, a partner at Silver Levine Chartered Certified Accountants based just up the road in Warren Street. We currently act for over 1,400 members of the bar from junior barristers to QCs, and we are also an uh, award-winning practice as well. Um, one of the prime concerns of, I'm sure, most of you, which is why you're here, is, is how you're actually going to fund your BPTC or your GDL courses and your uh, living expenses while you're training as a barrister. Um, the fees for BPTC courses are um, expensive, I think they're between £12,000 and £17,000 and that's without the as associated living expenses as well. There are a, a combination of uh, funding sources that are available to assist you with meeting the costs of the courses and your living expenses. There are a significant number of scholarships and bursaries that are provided by the four ends of court and I will um, shortly just go through a bit more detail on that. Um, many of you may, if, if that's possible, borrow some money from your parents um, and there are um, commercial loans through banks um, to assist with the, the funding of the courses as well. Some pupillages offer um, an actual advance on the pupillage award um, so depending on the chambers that, that if you do secure a pupillage early um, you can take a drawdown of a pupillage award prior to commencing pupillage so that may also assist with um, funding um, your living expenses during your BPTC course. All of the information I am about to impart is in the public domain and um, there are the various websites of the inns with all of the information so if you do require any further information it, it, is, it, it is out there. Um, the four inns of court, Lincoln's Inn, Inner Temple, Middle Temple and Gray's Inn all have different levels of funding um, in terms of the level of um, scholarships and bursaries that they will provide to students. Um, at the moment scholarships are across the inns are coming to about £5 million worth of funding in total. You need to be very selective um, when you decide to make your application to the inns. Um, you do need to pick the right one um, and you need to focus on the inn that you're going to have the best chances of success of actually um, obtaining a scholarship. It is all based on merit and your financial specific circumstances, um, so you do need to do your homework and you can only apply to one inn for a scholarship and you have to take up, you have to be a member of that inn to actually take the, the scholarship or the, the award. You need to be um, uh, realistic in your own skills and ability. Um, this is a costly exercise to um, pay for the BPTC training, so you want to be fairly sure at, at the end of all of this that you're going to have a, a, a chance of success of, of becoming, uh, obtaining a pupillage. Um, what the inns are looking for when they're assessing um, whether they're going to um, give you a, a scholarship is the the internet, your intellectual ability, your excellence in performance at university, your legal research skills, motivation and evidence of serious commitment to succeed at the bar, your potential as an advocate, your oral skills, um, which is examples of when you're uh, mooting or debating in mock trials, your personal qualities, personality, integrity, um, and as I said, your financial circumstances and need. Lincoln's Inn um, offers the largest level of scholarships and bursaries um, which for the, the current financial year is just under £1.5 million. It is concentrated um, for the CPE and BPTC years and as I said all awards are based on merit. At the moment um, there are 70 scholarships for Lincoln's Inn between £6,000 and £18,000 each. Um, although the size of individual awards would, would, it would be unlikely to cover the full costs of the, the BPTC. There are, um, they do offer uh, um, awards as well to cover accommodation at the inns and there are a number of bursaries as well um, of up to £3,000 each. The application process, you need to be aware of 
when um, the deadlines are for applying for the various um, scholarships and you need to make sure that um, your references also go in, that it's your responsibility um, that any references that they are provided with the application. Inner Temple's funding has increased this year to um, one and a half million pounds. Their, their scholarships vary, they're not fixed each year. Last year they issued 97 scholarships and the largest award was 22,000 pounds. <coughs> And Middle and Grey's um, Middle Temple, the funding was um, approximately a million pounds last year, of which 900,000 went for the BPTC courses. Um, some inns um, will, once you've applied, they m not all inns bring you in for an interview. So um, some inns, once they've assessed your application, will ask you to come in for an interview. Other, others won't, they'll just base it on your application. And Grey's Inn, they offer the smallest amount of wards of the four inns, which is about £830,000. It is a, a fiercely competitive market. As I said, you do need to be realistic about your skills and potential. Um, the other routes in terms of obtaining funding is through a professional or career development loan. And the, the banks that are currently providing that are Barclays, the Cooperative Bank and RBS through the Learning Skills Council. You can borrow between £300 and £10,000 um, and the Learning Skills Council will pay the interest on the loan while you're studying and then you'd repay that loan over an agreed period once you've finished your studies. There are um, also professional studies loans from um, high street banks and HSBC offer a graduate loan where you can borrow between a thousand pounds and twenty five thousand pounds and then you repay that at fixed terms. That's um, my bit on funding your career at the bar. Thank you. Thank you Mason. Hello everyone, my name is Peter Grossmark, I'm Mason's partner at Silver Levine. I'm very briefly going to try and explain to you how to save tax in the future. And if you come on a small journey with me, I'm assuming that you are all now just about to commence your second six. Um, there are exciting changes in the tax world, and you don't often hear an accountant say that. Um, what is going to happen, probably this year, maybe next year, is traditionally barristers always traded as individuals, sole traders. They are going to be able to trade as what's called ABS, alternative business structures, Potentially in the future, they can incorporate or be limited liability partnerships. So for those of you who do make it, you could have some very exciting <coughs> opportunities. I now want to just talk about the current rules as freelance individuals and just a few golden rules in the future how to save tax. Some of them are very obvious. The first point is not a saving but a common sense point that everyone knows and all too many barristers don't do. Sadly, however good an accountant is, you will pay tax, so you must put money aside for tax. It sounds so obvious, Mason and I see hundreds of barristers who sadly don't do this and have cash flow problems. So if nothing else from what I'm going to say, if you did that, it's worth a visit. <laughs> VAT. There is a rule in VAT that says, once you commence trading, and the commencement of trading is the commencement of your second six, one can go back three years prior to that date to reclaim VAT on any business assets one has acquired. A business asset is something you can kick, not that you should kick it. We would say it's the wig and gown, a wig tin, laptop, PCs, furniture. So even now, if you're buying a tablet or a laptop, which you feel that you could be using once you become a second six, keep the original invoice because potentially you could be reclaiming that VAT. The awards that you re will be receiving. You may be aware, but the award you receive in your first six is tax free. Second six award is taxable. Now, some sets weight the awards more to the first than to the second six. Clearly, that has a significant tax advantage. So when you're wandering around the upstairs and you're going through the various stands and you're talking to different sets, it's worth asking them about that. Once one commences trading as a freelance barrister, there is a significant tax planning point as to the choice of your accounting date. So many people choose the obvious fiscal date, the 5th of April, and that is indeed what the revenue wish you to choose. That can be bad news. 
by simply choosing the 30th of April, potentially throughout the rest of your working life, and that's a big deal, you can give yourself cash flow advantages. A, an income and expenditure account is a schedule to one's tax return. And each year you have to file a tax return, which must be filed by the following tax, the 31st of January. The more your business expenses are, the less tax one pays. That might be very obvious, but it's, it's worth knowing that. So what I want to very briefly do is just to rattle through the expenses which are for business purposes. The definition of a business expense is any expense with the exception of entertaining, which is incurred wholly and exclusively for business purposes. So I will read it so I don't forget any. Firstly, you'd have the direct costs of chambers, the rent, chambers, clerks, fees. You would have, as I already mentioned under the VAT, the capital expenses, as I just mentioned before, the wig and gown, wig tin, laptops, PCs. Travel costs, going from chambers to court to conferences. That travel can be public transport, cabs, however. I'm a user of Boris's or Barclays bikes. That charge can be claimed. <coughs> If one works from home, a percent we call a use of home as office, either a notional figure or a percentage of one's rent can be claimed. Subsistence. Subsistence is food. It's not breakfast, lunch or dinner. It's occasional food working unsociable hours, which as you may discover when you're a barrister, many unsociable hours of work. If you're fortunate enough to run a car and own a car and you use it for business, the business proportion of the car usage. Communication, that's mobile, internet, broadband, all these costs, the business proportion. Postage, printing and stationery, most chambers provide, but if you're out and about buying pens and pads. IT costs, cartridges, very expensive. Memory sticks. Research, the various books, Archbold, the white books, Re downloading stuff from the internet. Subscriptions, you have to join the, you join the Bar Council, but you could join Combar or any other associations, there's tax relief on that. You have to pay Bar Mutual for indemnity insurance. The next expense, the one closest to my heart, the accountancy fees. There is tax relief on accountancy fees, and if I just plug Silver Moon for one moment, for the first year, we, we don't make any charge. And if you come to our stand, we can tell you more about it, and indeed give you a memory stick, which will tell you and expand upon what I'm briefly saying. Course fees, CPD. Clothing, there's a case which means basically the suits you can't claim, but the bands and the collarless shirts, one can claim. Bank charges and interest, not on the loans, the student loans initially, or the loans we've been you'll be talking about this, we'll be talking about this morning, but any loans since the commencement of your second six, the interest will be allowed. So that's an overview, and what's left to me is I wish you all the best in your careers. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcus Sims, and I'm from the City Law School. And I head up the part time BPTC program, but I also teach on the full time program as well. I hope everyone can ha have a chance to get hold of one of the handouts. I'm not going to read through it because the information there I think you can all work out for yourself. I thought it'd be useful to have it in one place for you. I'm going to talk to you about applying to the BPTC and a little bit about how you can enhance your CV. Uh, and the application for that program, but also looking forward to pupillage. Just before I start, one thing I would add about funding which is, of course, that the bar program providers also have scholarships as well, so I'd certainly look at the um, different institutions that are offering the bar program as, as an alternative or an additional way of funding to the bar. Um, <coughs> the key dates, the one that you really want to look for, I suppose, is the 2nd of April, if you're in this cycle because that's when the acceptance deadline is around. The acceptance uh, offers are, sorry, the offers are out now for you to uh, look at and to mull over. This general pattern, I think, is the one one can expect if you're going to come into the uh, round for the next academic year. So obviously the dates here are for the current one, 13 to 14, for students who would be hoping to enrol in September. The uh, BCAT, which is uh, on the second page, which you may well be aware of by this stage, is the uh, Bar Course Aptitude Test, which is run by the Bar Standards Board through Pearson VU. And that is a critical reasoning test that you need to pass to be able to enrol on the BPTC. Uh, and one can sit that right up until the late part of August. 
but uh, the advice from the Bath Standards Board, and I think the advice from any provider, is to uh, attempt that test as soon as possible. I've got some details in there for you uh, about the costs and so forth. But the thing to remember about it is it is a critical reasoning test. It's about thinking, ways of thinking. You don't have to have done any of the subjects that are on the BPTC. So if you haven't studied evidence and you haven't studied litigation, that should not put you off from attempting the test now because it's about aptitude rather than content of the programme. Uh, just going back to the INS, which was mentioned a little bit earlier by Peter, is the thing you do have to do before you roll on the BPTC is you do need to be a member of the INN and the INN's closing date is earlier than you might think it's actually in May so at the end of May if you're going to come to join us in September so put these dates in your diary. Um, in addition to the, the, the academic uh, study awards that are granted by the INN's once one's a member of the INN the other <coughs> thing that can help you is they will help you with looking forward to your career so they can offer some assistance with applications to the BPTC although quite frequently and quite understandably they'll defer to the provider that you want to go to for that advice but they can help you with your CV, help you with thinking about and making uh, some moves towards applying for pupillage and it's just something there to remind yourselves is don't think about it in terms of applying to the BPTC, then applying to people. I would try and think about those two things as parallel projects for yourself to start looking now, even if you're not thinking of BPTC for this academic, coming academic year, start thinking about which sort of chambers you'd like to go to. The reason why I say that is because you need to do some reverse engineering to make sure you've got some evidence to show your commitment to that area of law and even sometimes that particular set of chambers and to start getting an evidence base to show that you have the qualities in addition to the BPTC and in addition to the Bar Sands Board's aptitude test, you have the specific qualities for that area of practice. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So if you look on page three, um, Ishman's going to say a little bit more in detail about the BPTC model. I've just listed them there. So I'm going to talk about the application. The application is an online application form to fill out, um, and I'm just going to run down that second tile on page three. The best thing you can do if you haven't already completed your degree is work hard on your degree. Degree classification is uh, uh, what is looked at both for applications <coughs> to the bar programme and also INS, and also be taken into account with scholarships and so forth as well. So knuckle under do pay attention to your lectures, do do the work, do your project, work hard for the assessments. I know, again, it sounds like common sense, but don't get distracted from that because that will quite often be the most determinative criterion on applications to the BPTC and for chambers as well. Okay. If you have got a um, career, uh, a second career going, or additional career going, that is something really to include in the application. The bar as a referral profession has many, many areas of expertise. So uh, don't play down your former working life. Uh, quite often it seemed to be a strength that you have done one job and then transferred to the bar. Uh, entering into the bar uh, at any age, any chronological age, and any stage in one's career is quite often a positive thing to do rather than a negative thing to do. And there is both on the BPTC application and also for the pupillage gateway application, there are boxes there for you to fill up talking about your work history. The key <coughs> thing is, if your work is not of a professional level, look for transferable skills, things that you had to do in your job that look like the sorts of aptitudes and skills that a barrister would need, particularly in the area of practice that you're thinking of applying to. Um, the box that's actually noted as skills is actually talking about your language ability, so foreign languages. I think this generally recognised amongst the bar that there, this is an area of weakness that the bar is trying to plug. So if you do have an additional language, no matter what it is, include that information, show that you have it at the uh, different levels. If you've got a, an exam pass, that's fine. If it was a, your second mother tongue, an additional language, include that. Computing skills, I think now, is pretty much a standard requisite in any working life, uh, but you are asked about your um, familiarity with that. Um, jurisdiction is easy to deal with. It's where you intend to practice, and many people who come to the BPTC intend to practice abroad, and that's perfectly fine. 
that's recognised. Uh, INS details we've talked about, BCAT I've talked about. If you've attempted the bar course before, you have to include that, and there will be space elsewhere for you to in include information about why you're having to make a second attempt. The bit I want to focus on is the supporting evidence. Mini pupillages, why you want to be a barrister, examples of your analysis of um, written work, examples of communication and interpersonal skills, advantages uh, and examples of advocacy, public speaking, <coughs> and how you've organised work when you're under pressure. I think you can understand what those questions are about. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just turn over the page and have a look at the next slide. I have done a lot of selection in my time, and I have a set of criteria that I'm working to. What I look for is evidence, not mere aspiration. I want to see when people are filling in those boxes, facts. I don't want just a wish list. And that's really why I really want to spend a bit of time on. Make those boxes, you've got a few hundred words to fill in on those boxes, and it's similar on the pupillage gateway uh, forms as well. Look for active past tenses. I did this, I have that, and look for objective measures. If you've got a classification of degree, do you know where you were in the ranking? Have you got, within your degree classification, is there a transcript that shows you did particularly well in the area of law that you now want to look forward to for your pupillage? Think about things in your outside life that aren't related to law, but can give you uh, evidence of transferable skills. And so I've listed a few things uh, under the next slide, which is societies and activities you can participate in. Mooting, uh, debating, client interviewing competitions, many universities have those opportunities, do take them. Even if you didn't win, maybe you got to the second round or you got to the final, but you were in the losing group. There you've got a ranking. I can see some evidence of how well you did. Uh, advocacy training, if you join in, they're often looking for students to play guinea pigs because they're training other tr people to be advocacy trainers. So participate in that way. Pro bono work, uh, we'll say more about as a panel, but voluntary work elsewhere. Maybe you're a school governor, or maybe you have a, a political career going and you've been a local councillor. All those sorts of things show evidence of working with people, giving advice, dealing with difficult situations. They can all give great examples for including the application for the BPTC and also perhaps for your pupillage gateway application. Um, also don't be, don't be shy about things that uh, you might think are a little bit light-hearted, like you've been involved in a drama society, or something that you think, well, it's a private matter, which you're a member of a church or a synagogue, or you've got a political career or philosophical career that you're running as well. Those things can all show analogies that you can build upon. Finally, just be a bit careful uh, about analogies. Uh, I'll say this now, I was going to say it a little bit later, but I'm conscious about the time, is when filling in the applications, just remember it's going to be read by somebody else. They may not see the world in the way you do. And, and I have read many applications where people say, my grandmother or my mother or my father say, I'm very argumentative. I think I'll make a great barrister. <coughs> Being argumentative is not the same thing as advancing an argument. Or filling in a form that goes on about how you want to help the disadvantaged, and then it says, I want to go to the commercial bar. It doesn't quite add up. Uh, the other one, my, my personal favourite, is I have been a litigant in person, person in X number of cases. That doesn't necessarily sound like you're going to be a great lawyer. But if you have been involved in those things, think about how you can represent them so they look like positives. So look <coughs> critically, reflect on your experiences. That's what the bar has to do when it's working as an independent person. Finally, if you can get involved with these specialist bar associations, that can be very helpful. Not all of the specialist bar associations will take student members. Some do, the Criminal Bar Association, the Family Bar Association do. Com Bar, which was mentioned earlier, which is the commercial bar, doesn't take student members. But you can become involved in commercial law by perhaps attending a conference or perhaps at your university there's a society that you can join that would show that commitment. So, those are my final points. Evidence. We're lawyers. We love proof. So ensure that you include that proof in your application forms.
Well, good morning, uh, everyone. I've been asked to speak for about five or ten minutes on the modules on the BPTC uh, and the way of working. For those of you who've taken the time to go to court, you'll know that when a lawyer says that they're going to speak for five minutes, you can set the hourglass running to see how many granules they'll have left at the end. But I promise I will be brief. As I said at the beginning, my name's Ishan Kolhatka. I'm a tutor at BPP. Uh, I was at the criminal bar for about 10 years and moved to BPP in September 2011. I mentioned this at the start because I want to begin by talking to you about the way of working on the BPTC. Why do you want to be a barrister? It's a question you're going to be asked repeatedly. It's on the BPTC application form. It's on virtually every pupillage application form. And I want you to think about it because it'll help you answer the question as to why you want to do this course and whether you're well suited to it. Let me take you back some years, I shan't say how many, to when I thought about becoming a barrister. And I'll take you back to me, probably aged about 14. I bought a game uh, for my computer and I took it home and I opened it up and my mum went up to the room and expected to see me on the computer playing. But no, I was there with the instruction manual, reading it away. I was a bit of a nerd. I know you wouldn't think it to look at me, but really, I was reading it and thinking, I've got to know exactly how this works before I do it. That solves the game, the problem, the way it works. As a barrister, you are there to solve a problem that someone has. And you've got to think practically as to how you're going to solve that problem, the game, and what the rules are, the instruction manual. Do I enjoy reading sometimes vast tracts of information, processing it, and then turning that into a solution? The BPTC is not the last year of academic study. It's your first year of your professional career. It's for you to do all the things you're going to do in practice. So, do I enjoy solving problems? Do I have this practical mindset? That's what you need to think about, I think, before applying for this course. Hopefully you're all here because that is what you have, whether you've thought of it in the same marginally nerdy way that I did. But you think, I want to solve a problem on someone's behalf, whether it's the man in the street or a massive multinational corporation. So with that in mind, the BPTC is arranged around 12 modules. And I'm going to go through them in the groups that they, they can be naturally grouped into. Uh, I'll start off with the knowledge subjects, civil litigation and criminal litigation. They are two large-scale exams, three hours, multiple choice questions and short answer questions. Jackie's going to go through exactly how they work. I'm not going to tread on her toes too much, I promise. Uh, but to tell you that... These are, as I say, practical. It's not about reading cases necessarily, but understanding how the litigation process works. This is the area where if you think in flowcharts and mind maps, I think you'll excel because you need to know how does a piece of evidence become admissible? What does the process look like for appealing my conviction? The exams are centered around that and so is the learning. It's a practically based pair of modules. The other uh, exam that is centrally set on quite large scale is professional ethics. And that's where you're taught the ethics uh, that you as a barrister must adhere to that are set out now in the bar handbook. So three modules there with three big sit-down exams. In addition to that, there are two other modules that run for half a year uh, and different providers structure them in different ways. But conference and alternative dispute resolution or resolutions of disputes outside court, whatever it's called at each provider. But these are two half-year modules that you do to learn about the interaction with people and how can you practically interact with someone and solve their problem or be part of a dispute resolution process. Then there are the five assessments, and we're getting eventually to 12, and I say, just pause for a moment to say that. 12 assessments, 12 modules, that's more than you'll do in a year at university. But we have the five that are really about persuasion. The two written skills, drafting and opinion writing, where you're taught to write like a lawyer. Hopefully, you're thinking like a lawyer on this course, and we want to see your ability to draft and write an opinion like a lawyer. And then the fun three, advocacy. I say the fun three, let's take them in turn. Advocacy one, or, or civil advocacy as it is at most places, making submissions to a judge. Now, I realise that for some of you, this is your lifelong dream, and I shan't shatter it by saying what I think of it. But, you know, if you want to talk to a judge in an isolated, cold room, that's very much for you. The fun two are cross-examination and examination-in-chief. 
and it's always interesting to see how people who start the year as friends in little groups, by the time you get to cross-examination, think of nothing more than cross-examining someone into the ground. But you learn you don't always have to cross-examine crossly, that sometimes slowly, slowly catchy monkey works as well. So those are the five, for me, the fun skills in the bar professional training course. There are also then two others, there's two options, and the options range at different providers, and, and it's something worth thinking about if you want to go to a particular area of the bar, whether the provider or providers you're looking at offer options in that area. If you've studied that module before, or that area of law before at university, it's not going to be recapping that, it's going to be looking at the practical skills involved in, for example, in employment law, in starting a claim, in how you'd have a conference with a client who feels that they've been unfairly dismissed. So you're taking that law that you've already learnt and putting it into a practical con context. If you've not studied one of those modules, or if you're a GDL or like me, then that in involves a little bit more background reading to get yourself up to speed on it. So that's two things. How you work at the uh, bar professional training course and the bar uh, as a whole, and the modules. The last thing I've been asked to speak about briefly, and I can see the clock so I will be brief, is pro bono opportunities and other things that you can do. The first thing, other things you can do, go to court. Go to court all the time. None of you will admit it, but some of you in this room must watch The X Factor. My excuse is I have a seven-year-old child, okay, so it's perfectly permitted. But if you watch The X Factor, and so, some nodding, yeah, uh, and you listen to someone sing a song, at some point you'll think to yourself, have they ever heard the song they're singing? Because this sounds nothing like it. Well, there's a real application with the bar to this. Go to court. Go and watch somebody examine someone in chief. Go and watch them cross-examine. Go and watch someone make an application for summary judgment. You can't ape the entire thing, but you can pick up some essential tips and little bits that will help your performance. So that's something you can do. Pro bono. There's a pro bono requirement within the course. You can look at this in two ways. You can either think, this is something dull that I need to get out of the way. I suggest that's not the way of looking at it. Instead, think, this is an opportunity to do something I have to do, but to further my career. If I have to go and do five pro bono hours and I really want to go to the family bar, why don't I go and find the family law project that puts me in touch with solicitors and members of the bar, with the specialist bar association itself, and with others who are involved in it? So when you see this pro bono requirement, please don't think, ugh, think opportunity. This is a way of furthering my career. So, in just about seven minutes or so, that is motivation and coming to the bar and how you work, the modules of the BPTC, and some pro bono work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so, um, as I said earlier, my name's Jacqueline Cheltenham. I'm the head of the bar course at the University of Law. Um, and they've saved the exciting bit for me, because I'm going to talk about assessments. <laughs> now, as Ishan has already mentioned, there are 12 assessments <laughs> I forgive you. Thank 12 you. assessments on the BPTC. Um, and three of those assessments are set by the Bar Standards Board. So it's the equivalent of doing GCSEs or A-levels. They are externally set and the tutors on the course do not know what is coming up in those assessments. So, um, so those are the three centralised assessments and they are uh, criminal litigation, evidence and sentencing, civil litigation, evidence and remedies, and professional ethics. So those three. As has been mentioned, they're assessed by a combination of a multiple choice question and short answer question. And the pass mark in all of the BPTC assessments is 60%. And in these particular three assessments, you have to get 60% in both the MCT part and the short answer question part. So you've got to get 60% in both sides. So it doesn't matter if you kind of really ace one side and you get 59.5 on the other side, you will not have passed the assessment. So <coughs> these are really important assessments that you really have to get your head round. They're also closed book assessments. So that means that you do have to do a lot of old fashioned hardcore revision um, to get through them. So that's just a warning now so that that's not a surprise for you when you come on the course. So those are the three centralised assessments. Um, there are there, The next assessment I'm going to talk about is the resolution of disputes out of court. Now this assessment and the other assessments are all set by the 
each institution. So the same as your university assessments and exams, they're set by the place where you're studying. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is resolution of disputes out of court because that has the same format as a centralised assessment. It's a mixture of multiple choice questions and short answer questions. And although the pass mark is 60% still, you don't have to get 60% in both sides. It's your cumulative uh, mark that counts. So as long as you've got over 60% in total, you will have passed that assessment. OK, so then after that, we've got the skills assessments. So the first one I'm going to talk about, um, which Ishan has just been talking about as well, is the sexy one that everybody's interested in, advocacy. So sexy and interesting that you're going to have three assessments in it, as has been mentioned. So the first one is um, um, an opposed application um, to a judge with a written skeleton argument. So written advocacy has become increasingly important over the last 20 or so years, and so you're assessed on that written element of advocacy as well, a persuasive skeleton argument <coughs> that you will back up with your oral submissions. And that's an opposed <coughs> assessment, so that means that you're against somebody else who's, also, who's arguing the other side, and you have an opportunity to respond to each other as well. Um, then the other two um, assessments are um, examination in chief and cross-examination and those you have an actor playing the part of the defendant or the, the witness that you have to examine in chief or cross-examine. So those are the advocacy ones. Then, as has been mentioned, you've got opinion writing, which is a written exam um, where you're, you're writing an opinion um, to um, perhaps somebody's had some, um, they're being sued and they want to know, do they have a defence? Should they negotiate the matter? Should they go to arbitration because there's an arbitration clause in their agreement? Whatever it is. Um, so you will write your written opinion on what they should do, how they should proceed in the matter and what's likely to happen. Drafting um, is the next assessment. Again, that's a written assessment. And there you're drafting the legal court, um, formal court documents that make up part of a case. So you have to draft those. And then finally, you have your two options assessments. As have been mentioned, these will be um, assessed by way of a skill, um, one of the skills that I've mentioned, but in the format um, of the subject that you've chosen. Um, in addition to that, the BPTC also assesses, although not formally, your ability to research things legally. So for all of your skills assessments, you'll have to carry out legal research. So it's definitely worth honing your legal research skills whilst you're on the GDL or on your undergraduate law degree. Um, and also <coughs> fact management. Now, managing the facts always sounds quite straightforward. And if you've got a short case, a quick dramatis personae or a timeline might be really easy to do. But if you've got some huge um, fraud um, that's taken place in the city, you might have enough lever arch files to fill this room, for example. So fact management can be quite an important skill, but it's not assessed separately. It's just part of your managing the facts for your skills assessments, the briefs that you get sent. So those are the assessments on the BPTC. And the last thing that I have to talk about, and I shall be very brief on this, is about technology um, that's used on the course and how difficult it might be for a candidate to grasp. Now, I think that um, in this brave new world in the 21st century, you all pretty much have a relatively good handle on um, on different aspects of technology, so I shall be quite brief about this. We did have one student that came to our university to do the LPC um, a couple of years ago who was about 80, and he did seem to have, he wasn't as up to speed on some of the technologies that perhaps the 21 year olds are, but I think virtually everybody who's either been in a career or is a, um, just studying now, having come straight through from school, will be on top of all of these kind of things. At the University of Law, the technologies that we use is we don't have um, formal lectures. We do all of our teaching groups of 12 or smaller. So the kind of technologies that you're going to come across are, um, obviously, we have an online library database. Uh, we have podcasts as, po as part of the course. We have demonstrations that you can watch online of barristers conducting conferences, which is, I think, the assessment that I missed out. Um, there is one further assessment that I've missed, the conference assessment, which is you um, speaking to your lay client, finding out what the issue is, what's brought them um, to the litigation process, and then giving them advice. So that's another oral assessment. And in that assessment, um, again, that person is played by an actor and you, the student, are playing the part of the barrister. So um, we have 
videos that you can watch online of people um, doing conferences, people uh, doing advocacy, so that you can get a better idea of what you need to be doing and look at different examples of it. We also have test and feedback questions that we use. So before you come to a class, you would need to do some reading, you go online, you answer some questions um, in different formats, there could be multiple choice, etc. Um, and in that format, you then immediately get the answers and how well you've done. Your tutor can also see that as well. And when you come to class, the tutors will say, um, OK, I've had a look at your test and feedback questions. Everybody got question one right, but a lot of you seem to struggle with question two, so let's go through that now. And they'll do that to help you understand um, that particular area of law or question that you've been asked. Um, and the final thing we have is in all the teaching rooms, we have equipment so that you can be um, recorded doing your um, advocacy practices and conference skills practices as well. So you can be videoed, you can take that away on a memory stick and watch yourself time and time again, if you can bear to watch yourself doing it, or maybe just the once, if you find it a bit tricky to watch yourself on screen. Um, so those are the technologies that we use, um, and those are the assessments that the BPTC comprises. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. Um.